Sound design. Nobody, nobody is going to hand you a job in this industry. If you don't get up and stuff envelopes with your headshot and resume and send them out, someone else, like the guy next door is doing that right now. Sound design. Sound Design Live is produced independently by me, Nathan Lively, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Welcome to Sound Design Live, the show to help you build your career as a sound engineer and the home of the world's first online career coaching program, Optimized for Audio Professionals. I'm Nathan Lively, and today I'm joined by filmmaker and the host of Roadie Fee Radio, Larry Milburn. Larry, thanks for being on Sound Design Live. You're very welcome, Nathan. Thank you for having me on the show. Cool. So, Larry, one question I like to ask everyone who comes on Sound Design Live, how did you get your first job in audio and video production? Uh, Well, let's see. I had moved out to Los Angeles in 94. I was an actor and a musician. And I would say my first gig, I kind of faked it till I made it. My first job in the uh, film and television industry uh, not was not as an actor. It was as a PA, as a production assistant for a TV show called Rescue 911. And um, I got a call. I didn't know anybody in LA, really. I knew like two people. I got a call from a buddy who was like, hey, you're going to get a call from the production coordinator of this television show. Um, and they're looking for a PA for a job. And here's what it is. And I said, okay, I think I can do it. And they called. And it really opened the door for me and my love for sort of the process and how things work and a lot of the behind the scenes stuff. Um, I got to do a lot. The show was great, even with, you know, production assistants in terms of letting us, you know, I would, I went around all the camera houses and I drove a truck and I had to pick up everything and, um, and all the camera guys and sound guys were super cool on those shows. And I asked a lot of questions and uh, yeah, so that it, it opened the door. And my understanding is that, production assistant is is kind of a catch-all and is kind of the entryway for a lot of people into the film industry, isn't it? Absolutely. You know, being a production assistant, it is. It's the entry way to go, you know, and, and it's a great way to learn because as a PA, you're going to work on so many different jobs. I mean, you know, and to borrow the term, you are kind of you know, you're basically a roadie of the set, right? I mean, you've you because you do everything. You mm-hmm. from from making someone's coffee or tea to picking up their dry cleaning to, you know, buying back, them drugs, buying them drugs. Yes, of course, and <laughs> and, and, uh, and those uh, <laughs> securing those questionable things. And uh, but then again, like I said, you know, you find yourself at crazy locations trying to figure out how to do. Um, things on the fly, you know, something goes wrong and a production coordinator, or if you're, you know, looks to you or a camera guy or a sound person looks to you like, okay, this just broke, you know, fix it now. And you've got to figure out how to do it. And, and, and the better you are in terms of asking questions and being attentive and focused, people remember, and those are the jobs, you know, and, and I'll digress for a second. Because I also worked a lot in theater as an actor, but as okay. a as a PA, right, um, and assisting directors and stuff. And you know, you start out, you know, go sweep the stage, go make me tea or make me coffee. And and I bring this up a lot because people are like, oh man, all I do is make coffee for somebody, or all I did was like carry their stuff. But mm-hmm. you know what? If you can't make someone's coffee properly. It's all a test. That's all it is, right? It's mm-hmm. all a test. And it's like, if you pay attention, you write things down, and you do what somebody asked you to do the way they asked you to do it, they're going to remember, and they're going to call you for the next job. Because mm-hmm. so, you cared. Because you cared, and you showed initiative, and you showed that you paid attention, and you know you were on time, and you listen, and all those sorts of things. You know? Yeah, it's that's important. cool. So, Larry, I, I think a lot of people listening probably already know about Ready Free Radio, but for those who don't and they want to check it out, what are a couple of episodes that you would recommend to sound engineers? Uh, For sound engineers particularly, I would say check out um, Sean Quackenbush's uh, episode. That's a great Mm -hmm. one. Sean's out with Brandy Carlisle right now. He spent 14 years or something with uh, Robert Randolph and the Family Band. Um, another great one, great one for a guy, uh, who spent a lot of years in the eighties, who was a songwriter, but also a producer engineer is Chaz Sanford. 
Okay. Um, and let's see, somebody else we got here, Courtney Taylor. Courtney Taylor's a great one. He's out with Far East Movement. He's a front of house engineer. And then uh, even going back even further into the episode archives here, I mean, I've got Pearl Jam's longtime uh, monitor mixer, Carrie Kai's. She's been with them for 25 years. You say Kai's? It's Kai's. It's Carrie Kai's. Oh, man. I've said keys this whole time, but I don't think I've ever said that to her face. So Yeah, you know what? <laughs> I, and, I, and I'll tell you, I was doing my research on her and I found an article on her and they actually showed the pronunciation of it and it said That's like helpful. you know kai's not keys whatever and i was like oh my kai's like eyes and i was like oh shit okay. okay um and then there's one other episode going way back and i and i refer to this woman a lot Fela davis uh she was one of my early episodes she is a member of sound girls the organization that carrie kai's uh, started to help empower and educate young women in the field of audio but Fela is I think in my in my notes about her, my description for her, you know, I said in the dictionary under inspiration, there's a picture of Fela because oh, she, wow. she came from nothing, uh, nowhere around her were people doing audio, but she knew at a young age she wanted to do it. And she would put pictures up in her room of boards and of gear and, <laughs> and, and found her okay. way. And I think she went to full sail. Uh, I think that's correct. Um, and she figured out how to do it and she drove a lot of miles to get to the nearest house of blues, you know, and slept in her car and learned from a lot of people and, and then finally came to New York and Brooklyn and she's just an inspiration and I would definitely check her episode out. Fela Davis. So Larry, you've been doing this for a while. Um, looking back on your career so far, what is what you think is one of the most important decisions you made that helped you get more of the work that you really love? I would say it's a few things for me. It's a, and I don't even know if they're decisions so much as as a you know a little credo. But I continuing education. I love continuing education. I love uh, pushing myself to learn as an editor, a film editor. I took a lot of Final Cut Pro classes back in the day when I was a Final Cut Pro user. Now I'm Adobe Premiere. Okay. Uh, I switched over, but um, you know a lot of classes, a lot of networking. Uh, don't think you have the answers. I don't ever think I have the final and right answer. I ask a lot of questions. I lean on the people that work for me and with me. Uh, you know, in what we do, whether it's filmmaking or live sound or whatever it is, it's a collaborative medium. And the only way you're going to learn and get better is to not be too prideful uh, about asking and learning and, and trying to develop your you know, your, um, your skills, because they, they're always changing. There's always new technology. There's always new stuff. And there's always cool little things to learn. I'm, I'm now a slave to YouTube. I follow, okay. <laughs> I follow some people a lot and I, and I watch a lot of their stuff and you pick up little things along the way. So I think, you know, continuing to learn, wanting to learn and wanting to be better, that's helped, you know, grow my skills and my career. Um, and, and I'd say one last thing, cause I did think about this, Nathan, when you sent the questions was, I'm not afraid to say no to a job. And, you know, my twenties and, you know, most of my thirties, I took everything because I'm trying to learn and whatnot. As I got a little older, I was like, you know what? I, the power of no is a big one because I won't take something just for the money. If I feel like the job is going to be. Uh, is going to lead me down the wrong path or not be satisfying. Having said that, sure. I'll take a job for not a lot of money if I think that the people I'm going to work with are good, if the project itself is going to be rewarding, and again, if I think I'm going to learn something on the job. Well, let me ask you about that, and then I want to back up and ask you about um, the education. So how do, you, how do you say no? Can you give me an example of how to kind of let someone down without... And people are so afraid of burning bridges, right? And and like maybe that's made up and maybe it's not, but like people come to you with a thing and you want to make them happy and you want to help them out and give them what they want. Um, we're in the service industry and that we really like working with people and so we don't like to say no. So um, how do you do that? Um, I think, you know, yeah, yeah, obviously you have to be somewhat uh, <laughs> judicious and, and somewhat political in your approach, but you just have to be nice and you know, some, a lot of times I'm honest and a lot of times I'll just say, you know, look, uh, I, I, something's come up or I don't, um, 
it's not going to work out schedule wise. You know what I mean? Or listen, I, a lot of times I'll get approached by nonprofits and to do you know the film stuff that we do, and I. I do take on a certain number of nonprofits. I don't have a set number, but it's, you know, you kind of know like what your, what your yearly thing is, your yearly sure. nut is you got to make. Right. And, and so I'll look at that and say like, you know, I can't really afford to do it right now. I, I really love what your company's about. I really love what you're about. I'd love to help you out. I just, I don't have the time in my schedule right now. Why don't we circle back, you know, later if you still have a need. Or I'll check in, and a lot of times I will check back with a, a somebody or you know a company, whatever it is. If I've, let's say, bowed out the first time, and circle back, you know, a couple months later, and just say, hey, how did that go for you? You know, did you sure, find somebody? Great. Did you find somebody? Did they do a good job? Were you happy? You know, is there anything I can help with? So, and then they still see you as a resource. Then they still see you as a resource, and obviously that's super important. And maybe it didn't go well, you know with with whoever they ended up with and the fact that you took the time to reach back out and check in on them speaks volumes now i don't do that all the time because like i said you know you can tell if you've been in this business and whatnot long enough uh you know you know that uh you know you can you can get burned and you can you your instinct meter will go off and say you know what this is not something or someone that i want to or need to get involved in and the key other key part of that, Nathan, that I'll put out is that I would rather starve for that week or two weeks that I would have been on that job, you know, working for little money or maybe it's a lot of money, but not had a great experience. I'd rather starve for those couple of weeks and take that time to either learn a new skill, practice something I've been working on or make other connections. Immediately when you talked about education, I had a follow up question, which is, Where's kind of your go-to place for that? But then you mentioned YouTube. So I'm wondering, is that what you think of when you think of, uh, oh, I need to learn a new thing, specifically like I want to learn how to crochet next or I need to learn how to swim. Do you immediately go to YouTube or is there another place or maybe some, some person that you know that you'll go to for that? When I lived in a bigger city, it was easier to hop into a place and take a weekend course or a week-long course or whatever it was and have that resource. Local physical Something, schools. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I spent a lot of time at uh, UCLA doing the UCLA Extensions Program, for example. Okay. Um, you know, up here, depending because I live sort of in the middle of nowhere, it is easier to hop onto YouTube. But having said that... After this many years in the entertainment industry, I've got a pretty awesome network of people that I can call on, that I can write, that I can Skype with, and I do that. You know, um, I'll reach out to you know Mike Pierre, Analog Man, for example, who makes uh, guitar effects pedals. You know, I play guitar, and it's like if I have a question about something, I'll call him. Uh, another gentleman who's actually been on the show, also Alex Salzman's a producer. You know, if I have a question about a recording technique or something like that. I'll shoot Alex an email and say, hey, man, I'm, I've got this coming up. What do I do? I actually, you know what? That just happened. I just got hired to, um, to use my studio for somebody else. A lot of times it's just for my own personal use. But someone else reached out and they needed uh, studio time. And I didn't really quite know what to charge for that. I could tell you what I charge okay. for, um, you know, for what I do as an editor sure. and whatnot. Right? But I didn't quite know what to charge. So I reached out to Alex and said, hey, man. You know, like I have this thing, specific thing happening. What do I charge for something like that? And he gave me a, a ballpark. And I was like, okay, that's pretty much what I thought. So I was able to bounce that off. So a lot of times it's, you know, it is YouTube. I'll hop in there and, and put in something specific or, or follow some of the people that I follow. And, you know, a lot of times it's stuff that I might know. But there are always a little quirks and things that I get that, um, you know, that help out. You've interviewed a lot of sound engineers on your podcast over the years. Um, as you look back over all of them, can you find kind of a common thread? Maybe what's one of your biggest takeaways from learning about all these different careers in pro audio? You know, I think honestly, one of the common threads that I found with people is that they all had a ferocious desire to learn. They wanted it bad enough and a lot of times, because I will ask their, you know, if they have advice for young people or if they could go back and talk to their younger selves, sure. um, what would they say? And most often, a lot of them just say, I just wanted to learn. I knew 
you know, I saw this particular concert. I saw what these people were doing. I saw a particular movie, whatever it is. And they weren't discouraged. You know, they stuck with it. They found a way to learn. Whether that was going out and buying, you know, a small two-channel Mackie mixer, taking their parents' television apart or stereo apart or whatever, and putting it back together to make sure it would work, they found a way to learn and they found a way to progress. And so I think, you know, it sounds all cliche when you start boiling it down, but it's like sticking with it, not taking no for an answer, um, and and following your curiosity uh, is really is really the thing I think that's been a common thread with people. And asking yeah. asking questions, you know, finding a mentor here and there, someone who will guide you. There there are always people out there that will help you. Like I said in the beginning, you know, if you're if you're the person who asks a lot of questions, you've got a good demeanor. You res- you're respectful of the process and of the people around you. People will show you things. They will. Sounds like a quality of curiosity, a quality of being unstoppable. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and following your dream. If that's your dream, go for it. Go for it. You'll, if nothing else, once you exhaust it, you'll know, okay, I tried it. And it's not for me for whatever reason. You know, you don't like being on tour. Okay, well, maybe figure out you don't like being on tour and being on the road all that much, but you really like audio production. So you go work at a studio, maybe. And then that leads you to become, you know, the best producer or Grammy winning producer. You know what I mean? It it, it can throw you different curveballs. And that's definitely something that has come up in interviews with my guests, you know, where they started out on one track and they're like, wait, I really actually like this. And not only do I really like it, it then became the thing that they were known for. One thing that one person wanted me to ask you when I posted about you on Facebook yesterday is tips for people that want to start on the touring industry, please. And I don't know exactly what that question is, but I I guess you have talked to a few number of people and you have seen how some people's career paths have played out. And so I guess if you were to imagine someone who is a sound engineer already, um, but maybe wants to get into touring, can you think of anything that might help them without knowing who this person is or what their situation is? As I've talked to my guests who have all then gone on to be on the road, more often than not, they said it was right place, right time. Now, Mm -hmm. What is, you know, can you, can you hope for right place, right time? You can work toward right place, right time. You know, Randy Brown, uh, who's currently the drum tech for um, the Magpie Salute, and he's been out with Todd Rundgren for years and years. He worked at uh, Studio Instrument Rentals in New York. And literally, uh, Roberta Flack, you know, he was helping Roberta Flack one day, and the next day the manager was like, hey, we need somebody. You want to come out with us? Like, tomorrow? And that was it. Sean Quackenbush, you know, same exact thing. He makes front of house for um, Saratoga Performing Arts Center. He was, that's what he did, right? He was that guy at that place, not touring. And Robert Randolph and the family band came through. And they were so impressed with the job that he did. um, And they were supposed to bring their own guy. And that guy couldn't make it. And so Mm -hmm. Sean had to do it. Literally, he got a call on his headset at the end of the night the band would like to see you. And he was like, Oh my God, I mixed it too loud trouble, (laughs) you know? And they got, he got backstage and the manager was like, listen, you got it. That was the best they've ever sounded. Would you like to go on the road with us? And he was like, okay, it took a couple of months for it actually to happen, but that's how it happened. So I think, you know, how would you get a job? You know, start, first of all, start mixing for bands, right? Cause you never know your local bands, you never know. They're going to go on a little tour. They're going to do this and that. And, you know, you roll into a club somewhere and maybe the opening, I mean, maybe the, the, um, the headlining act, here's what you did for that, the opening band that you're with. And they're like, dude, our guy just dropped out. Your stuff sounded great. Come with us. Mm -hmm. So keep working, putting your name out there, you know? Um, my friend, Rui Faustino wants to know if you have been to Portugal. (laughs) <laughs> I've never been to Portugal. I would love to go to Portugal. Are you right, are you so offering? It sounds like it sounds like he's offering. So I guess you're staying at Hui's house whenever you go there. Okay, Hui, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it, man. Um, my friend Thurston wants to know how this union thing works. 
So another very general question, but um, I myself have had a lot of misunderstandings about the union in the past as well and have not worked with the union. It's always just kind of been this thing to deal with, you know, like, oh, this is a union house or uh, when I move to this town, like I am going to have to work with the union. So maybe that's what he means. Like, am I going to get more work if I join a union? Am I going to like it? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? So I don't know if you have any experience with the union, Larry, but um, if you want to try and shed some light on how this union thing works for Thurston, you can. (laughs) Well, I may get in some trouble for this, but here's a couple of short answers. One, I'm not in any union right now. I've never been in any sort of a stagehands union or anything like that. The only union I was ever, two unions I were in were SAG and AFTRA. Um, and here's what I know about unions. They, they are there to protect you. If you can get into a union, it is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Having said that, Um, I know a lot of people that are in unions that still take non-union work because at the end of the day, you have to make money. And Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I think unions are a great thing. Like I said, you know, they are there to help you. They can be resources. They provide a a sort of family for you to fall back on. But I also know that they can be sticky wickets. You know, I mean, they can be the sort of thing where like, oh, yeah, you're not allowed to pick up that pencil even though it's in the way because there's a union guy who can touch that pencil, but you're not in that union. So you can't pick up that pencil. Yeah. Um, you know, that happens on film sets all the time. Yeah. Um, but, uh, Hey, you know, when that, uh, overtime kicks in and golden time and whatnot, you start making good money with the union. That's a good thing. They're there for you. <laughs> and, and conversely, you know, people will try to work you 15 hours a day. And if you're not in the union, nobody's there to step in and be like, no, you can't do that. Larry, you might not have anything to say about this, but I'm always curious if people like you have a business coach or a mastermind group, if there's some way that you're sort of promoting your own evolution as an entrepreneur, because that's what we are, right? We're Some people think of themselves as, I'm just a roadie or I'm just a sound engineer, but we're all also probably freelancers and we're all also business owners and entrepreneurs. So, Um, is there anything you're kind of doing to kind of force yourself to evolve in that area? You know, I had someone who was a bit of a life coach when I lived out in LA, let's say. Okay. And they helped with a lot of those things in particularly keeping me on track. You know, I would come in one week and talk about like, I want to reach out to this guy or this gal or this thing and do that. And then the next week I'd show up and he would hold my feet to the fire and say, did you do those things? Did you reach mm-hmm. out to that guy? Did you make that phone call? Why not? What's stopping you? So enough of that <laughs> over the years, you know, kind of seeped into my system. I, and, and so I do that a lot now. I have my own, you know, little process now in terms of a notebook and I check things off and do that. It sounds like um, accountability external accountability from someone else was something that was really helpful to you at one point. And, and then you sort of internalize that. And now you're doing that for yourself. Yes. And, you know, the other thing, too, when I was an actor years and years ago in L.A., didn't know anybody, trying to get auditions, in the morning when I would wake up, there was always that part I was like, oh, man, I should go back to bed. I'm exhausted. (laughs) Okay. Right? And then this other voice would creep in that would say, if you don't get up and stuff envelopes with your headshot and resume and send them out, someone else like the guy next door is doing that right now Mm -hmm. so to me it's the same thing right if you don't wake up every day and send an email to that person you've been thinking about uh someone else is going to hit them up and someone else is going to get the job so you know there is definitely um a a large amount of drive nobody nobody is going to hand you a job in this industry you know Um, and so there's a large amount of self-starting that has to happen, whether you are a filmmaker or a sound person, um, people remember you. I don't really advertise like my filmmaking business. All my jobs come through word of mouth and the same with the, like for the podcast, for example, if we can talk about that, like I, I've grown that thing organically and I try to make the interviews fun And nine times out of 10, when I take off the headphones with somebody, they're like, man, that was really a lot of fun. And so when I reach out to somebody new, a new guest, I make sure to tell them like, hey, I did these other like, you know, people like-minded like you. And and I've had people follow up. I mean, 
Matt Umanoff, Umanoff Guitars. You know, he's he was a tough customer to try to get, but he followed mm-hmm. up with a couple of people, and he told me it's like I'm going to call these people and find out how the show was, and uh, and he did, and and thankfully wow. those people had a good time, and so he was like, all right, man, let's do this, and cool. You know, you got to be nice to people. That's the best promotion you can do. Be okay. nice to people. <laughs> Uh, so, Larry, where is the best place for people to follow your work? As a filmmaker, you can follow me at milburnmediaarts.com, M-I-L-B-U-R-N-M-E-D-I-A-A-R-T-S.com, milburnmediaarts.com. The podcast, roadiefreeradio.com. We're also on SoundCloud, iTunes, and Google Play. And then we are all over social media, uh, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all that good stuff. Okay. And then on YouTube, I should say, we, we, I've, I've kind of oh, opened yeah. up the you're, channel. You told me you're doing some videos related to the podcast on YouTube. Yep. We're going to start filming um, a few more of the interview episodes as well. And then um, I've, I've done my first unboxing, which is, a, okay. which is a big one. I got sent a piece of audio gear and I was like, let's unbox this thing. And I got to do a review on it. And, and, uh, and I've posted a bunch of other behind the scenes things that I've cut. And, and I've also started to film me doing the podcast, just the intros. Because okay. I, I film, I you know I record my interviews at another time, and then I do the intro. So I film those so people can watch. You know they can see me in various states of, uh, you know, disheveledness in, in the in the middle of the night or in the morning whenever I do my intros. And so anyway, those right so, I'm, so I'm building up the channel, Nathan. Larry, thank you so much for joining me on Sound Design Live. You're very welcome, Nathan, and thank you for having me. And uh, I hope uh, hope your audience got something out of it, man. If they didn't, they They can go to hell. Sound design. Live.